I'm really pleased to be here and it's great to see that you guys are all here because presumably you care about microbiome research and uh, and really uh, you know uh, oh first I just want to mention I've these slides are a uh, version of these is available through bioinformatics.ca where we present a version of this this is uh, changed a little bit but it's still under the same Creative Commons license but but uh, today what we're going to basically do is talk about um, what biomarkers are and their utility I know the basics of identifying them, be aware of some examples. I'll just go through, a, in particular, one case study of examples of biomarkers identified for microbiome data. And really, um, I can't emphasize this enough, it's a, the appreciating the importance of careful, conservative analysis. You know, we'll be bringing this up a lot, and I think you've already heard a bit about that. And, for example, with the issue of OTUs, I just want to add a comment that you know, there'll be times where OTUs are mentioned here, but you could easily substitute that with any kind of measure or grouping of sequences. Uh, and so just keep in mind uh, that uh, a key thing, though, is just to avoid that kind of push-button bioinformatics, and that's really why you're here to learn how to do things and, and consider all of the issues and pitfalls to watch out for. Anyways, before I start, though, I would just love to get to know the audience a little bit. Uh, and I heard that you guys haven't been actually even asked um, some basic demographics. So I'm just wondering, uh, how many of you would consider yourself like a primarily computer scientist, a primarily sort of microbiologist, molecular biologist, or uh, primarily both? So like who would say they're like computer science a bit more? So there are a few. So we weren't sure. Uh, I was just chatting with other faculty. And, and how, who would say that they're more of a microbiologist? Okay. And then who would say that they're, um, you know, really a mix of both? Uh, great. Yay, I'm glad to see that group is increasing. So that's awesome. Uh, so, uh, uh, but that said, um, everybody comes at this from these different perspectives. And, um, and it can be hugely valuable. And I will try to bring up a few points that are relevant to the different groups, because you really are in different points in a spectrum. Uh, OK, but anyways, uh, first I just uh, want to step back for a second and just say, you know, really, microbiome research is exploding. I mean, I could show some graph about how much microbiome research has increased. But, you know, really, um, some notable developments have occurred. Uh, you know, one of my favorites is this idea of humans can now be identified by their own microbial cloud. Um, you know, this kind of concept that, uh, uh, you know, like it, it's, a, if I remember, there's a relative of mine saying, it's like the aura, you know, <laughs> we got this microbial cloud around us. And, uh, but, uh, but these, these have huge implications in terms of this concept that there are potentially markers, you know, of people, of things, of diseases, of other states. And so, um, you know, this has really exploded. And what's happened is a lot of researchers outside of, of traditional microbiology and cancer research and heart disease research and even and depression uh, research are starting to look at the microbiome and look at the role of the microbiome and in particular interested in mark markers of disease and disease prognosis predicting uh, in particular how uh, how sick somebody's going to get um, as a sign of how much that's arrived Merriam-Webster dictionary in case you don't know is now defined microbiome and uh, uh, so they've come up with a, so that's a sign that it sort of exists uh, so there's now a definition by Miriam Webster and uh, I think the really great uh, sign that things have um, you know microbiome research has really arrived is you can now there's this own microbiome game the minute you have your own game right for something that's a sign that something has really arrived so I encourage you to check out the gut check microbiome game which actually you can purchase through a um, a laboratory supplies company, so some labs have been purchasing it, and it looks like supplies that they claim on there. <laughs> but uh, I haven't done that. But uh, but basically, uh, you know, this research has really taken off, and there's a lot of interest in biomarkers uh, for a few reasons I'll mention. And but first, let's just step back. You know, what are biomarkers? Uh, very generally, measurable biological property that can be indicative of some sort of phenomena, such as infection, disease, environmental disturbance. And uh, a key thing to appreciate is, is primarily we're interested in either functional biomarkers, like looking at biological functions, genes, proteins, metabolites, that are specific to either one organism or a bunch of organisms, or we're interested in taxonomic uh, biomarkers uh, that can be specific for a, a, spe a specific species or category of organisms, including the uh, um, 
OTUs that, uh, you know, there are some concerns about. But uh, why we want to identify them? Uh, really, uh, one of the primary reasons these days is to detect and diagnose phenotypes more quickly. Uh, you know, there really is um, a benefit to doing this very quickly, cheaply, more accurately versus, say, metagenomic sequencing. Um, the idea of uh, predicting prognosis of disease, being able to treat certain people uh, differently based on their prognosis. Um, there's also the interest in bugs as drugs and, and using them as therapeutics, which has interesting um, issues because uh, bacteria are sort of considered in this sort of gray zone of are they actually, if you get um, a bunch of bacteria put into you uh, like a fecal transplant, is that considered more like a tissue transplant of cells or is that considered a drug, a therapeutic? And they, the, the rules around uh, patenting and protections around uh, drugs versus tissue transplantation are very different. So there's a lot of um, interesting issues around that. But there's really, uh, you know, growing success stories. It's still early days, but, uh, you know, one I wanted to highlight um, <coughs> that I thought was neat was just this concept of looking at a bunch of um, children, infants in the first 100 days of life, uh, looking at children that have developed asthma or, or not, and uh, looking at what bacterial changes uh, in their microbiome, their gut microbiome were occurring, and they found that there was these uh, four uh, species that, that start with FLVR, um, and so they called it the flavor bacteria. And these flavor bacteria are decreased in early life in these the, the children that had asthma versus not asthma. But notably, so this was like a biomarker, you know, literally of asthma, but notably when they added flav these flavor bacteria to germ-free mice, they decreased airway inflammation, implying that they really could be um, you could even use a therapeutic, and so there's again that bugs as drugs concept of finding these biomarkers of things that have changed, and then maybe those microbes can be re-added if there's a dysbiosis or change in the microbiome that um, basically could be corrected. Um, but there's lots and lots of applications, and I'm not going to go through this uh, much, uh, just to say that there's differentiating infl inflammatory bowel disease from related disease, detecting colorac colorectal cancer. Uh, looking at COPD in the lung, looking at human mu milk microbiome, <laughs> protecting against uh, mastitis, and then a whole suite of environmental biomarkers and uh, markers of pollution, ecosystem health, etc. So there's a really lot of um, lot of different applications, but what I'm going to focus more on is sort of biomarker <coughs> selection. Uh, I want to emphasize this is going to be a bit of a High level overview. Think uh, the goal is to get you thinking about issues, pitfalls, things to watch out for. Not uh, going into a lot of detail, but uh, but basically, biomarker selection is a process of removing these non-informative or redundant uh, sequences, identifying the ones that are differential between a couple of conditions, right? And so uh, to find those, you know, we've got the sort of uh, combination of bioinformatics of taking sequence, looking at quality control, quantification of different sequences, and basically identifying these sequences, and then applying statistical methods to those sequences to help find the useful biomarkers. And then, of course, the key part of this finding biomarkers is validation. So you can find something, but key is to validate. And uh, just for the computer scientists, we, more computer scientists oriented people, just, we just want to talk about primers that pick out your sequence of interest from a sam sample, and often we're interested in qPCR for validating of looking how many times those primers sort of snag our biomarker of interest. Uh, but uh, in terms of how we find them, you know, first things first, you really have to have a plan of, you know, what kind of biological data are you looking at uh, and what kind of marker are you looking at? Like, are you looking at uh, uh, viral data or are, are you looking at, um, a, you know, 16S data versus metagenomics data, etc. And then, uh, then there, of course, there's the issue of obtaining biological samples, getting the DNA, and then you get into the more biomarker part, which is identifying these mar uh, the potential biomarkers, things that are more or less abundant, right? Then validating them. Uh, usually, you do it in silico and then in vitro, as I'll go over. And then you further optimize, uh, usually by uh, checking for other closely related uh, sequences as well. 
But uh, in terms of um, options for biomarker ID, uh, one thing I do want to emphasize is that you sort of can look at bacteria, viruses, or eukaryotes, but I really encourage thinking about combinations, as I'll talk about more later when I show some actual data on a time course. Uh, but uh, really, bacteria, you know, are sort of the wily most studied. Um, <coughs> shotgun or sequence 16S amplicon analysis by shotgun, I mean sort of metagenomics. Uh, but widely the best studied, most methods developed, that's sort of the easy route. Um, there is virus viral data, <coughs> either shotgun or there are amplicons, RDRP and G23 that are used for viruses. And uh, that certainly... One of the big issues there is it can be challenging to get enough DNA. Um, and But uh, as I'll show you in an example data set, uh, this idea of um, viruses potentially having some more specificity holds promise. So sometimes you can see things that are different in the viral, um, in a viral analysis versus bacterial analysis that might be useful in terms of biomarker identification. Um, for eukaryotes, there ha again, hasn't been as much done because the large genomes really make shotgun difficult, and there are concerns about these sort of marker-based analyses like 18S or ITS. But uh, but they certainly uh, there have been a lot of methods developed for uh, eukaryotes. Uh, but again, um, you've got that sort of bio side, but you've got the marker side. You know, what kind of marker do you want? So there's really considerations. Again, combinations are recommended. Uh, you've sort of got taxonomic, where you can use your amplicon or shotgun data and identify taxa. Uh, but the problem is you can have that kind of strain level diversity. You can, you can get false positives, false negatives, if you really don't know what your taxa is like. And really, uh, you know, as I think has been alluded to, you know, what is a taxonomic group? It's a very difficult um, and sort of somewhat arbitrary concept uh, in some cases. And, uh, and then uh, most notably, in some cases, they can be more variable across some environments. That can be useful in some cases, but in many cases, that level of variability can be really problematic if you're just wanting to just generally identify something um, consistently. Uh, Gene-based are becoming of increasing interest. You know, really, the, uh, you, you, you need shotgun data for that is the big problem. Uh, DNA or an RNA if you get transcriptomics, uh, but uh, it is so it, it becomes more expensive, right? Because the amplicon data, because you really do need that metagenomics. But I, I, as I'll allude to later, I really encourage doing metagenomics, at least some metagenomic sampling of your experiment, because I always find people end up finding it the most useful. You can use 16s or something to. Um, get a broad uh, feel for your data, get an idea of variability, get a sense of, uh, you know, how de generally the taxa are behaving, what taxa are there, what, uh, you know, and also as we'll be talking about later, Morgan, who you've seen lots and you're going to see more of, Morgan Langell is uh, going to talk about pie crust, a tool for looking at 16S data, taking it a level further of predicting function uh, from it. But metagenomics data really does give you a lot of things that you can't get from uh, 16S. So it's always good to at least maybe do a survey with 16S, but then delve into taking a few uh, metagenomic samples. Uh, the one uh, sort of issue is you can have some complications with the domain-based gene architecture, but generally uh, sometimes you'll find there'll be some functions or gene functions or markers you can identify that are more consistent across different samples uh, than taxa necessarily are. And this is where also pie crust comes into play because, again, you're getting down, you're moving away from taxa specifically to, to functional groupings. Um, other uh, uh, types are, you know, diversity metrics. Don't forget about looking at uh, alpha and beta diversity. Have you guys actually, I can't remember, did they cover alpha and beta diversity yet at all? Yeah, okay. And... Uh, <laughs> And then using microbiome analysis to suggest other metabolic markers. That's one, one way we went with one uh, project. Uh, but, uh, um, but let's just talk first about, um, you know, just getting a marker, some general, very basic statistics. Uh, you know, for many of you who will have taken a statistics course, this is obvious, but I just want to remind you about some basics here that a basic concept of a good biomarker, you know, you're looking at signal to noise and you're looking at basically your class means have to be far apart, okay? So for example, this is just using, talking about OTUs, but again, this could be any kind of grouping. 
Um, so you might have uh, sort of your sample frequency and your abundance, and if you plot that, uh, you know, a good biomarker of say your condition that is um, actually it doesn't look uh, doesn't show up very well. Uh, so you have maybe your condition you're interested in uh, that's uh, you know the blue condition. Um, it doesn't really matter, but uh, you know this OTU is of interest because it's very different. The mean is very different from the OTU one, and there's also tight variance. There's little overlap. Um, in this case, uh, where you have um, uh, you know I guess I, I guess I should use a red example. Sorry, and uh, but in this case. Uh, this is an example of not ideal where you have lots of overlap, uh, the, the means are not far apart, and you've got uh, an issue with maybe not as uh, tight a variance as well. And uh, basically, uh, abundance in general, usually you're following a normal distribution, so it pays to look at that. And why am I not able to? There we go. Okay, so, uh, you know, Here's um, just an example of looking at a normal class and a, quote, blue class, okay? And uh, so we have maybe samples 1 to 5, and we've measured OTUs 1 to 3 again. These could be any kind of classification. They could be gene sequences 1 to 3 or what are, um, uh, you know, KMERS uh, 1 to 3. Uh, but uh, essentially what you're doing here is, um, is looking at, oh, sorry. Um, you're looking at what makes a good biomarker. So if you're interested in differentiating this uh, normal and blue class, obviously this OTU1 is looking really great. You can see that uh, you've got something where you see clear difference. If you look at these things and then put them down here, you'll see that OTU1 uh, is clearly increased and very consistently in samples 1, 2, and 4 versus samples 3 and 5. OTU2 is, is more inconsistent, where you get some sometimes higher and lower. And then you have the OTU3, which is no difference at all. So you're basically, again, you're trying to look for those ones where you're seeing that uh, clear difference and a consistent um, measure. So uh, they basically you do Cisco techniques. Um, you can range from very simple, like a simple t-test to compare them. You can write your own statistical analysis, or you can use some really nice... Uh, more complex methods. Left C is a very popular one, uh, implemented in a Galaxy workflow. Uh, is, have you guys heard? Have they heard about Galaxy yet? Uh, Galaxy is something that allows uh, somebody who's not a, a computer scientist who wants to make basically make workflow of doing a series of analyses um, in a fairly user friendly uh, way <laughs> through a, a web based interface and. And certainly, I encourage you if you're not, if you're a biologist wanting to do more metagenomics analyses, uh, getting familiar with Galaxy or genomics analyses, period, getting familiar with Galaxy could be a very useful uh, tool to use. But uh, LEFC is, um, as one example, uh, metagenome seq is another example implemented uh, uh, using R. And uh, I, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but um, uh, really, uh, the idea is it's identifying these features, uh, characterizing the difference between two or more conditions. First, it ID statistically different um, features among classes uh, using this non-parametric um, factorial KW sum, uh, sum rank test. But then uh, key is it performs uh, pairwise tests using these subclasses, uh, using an unpaired uh, Wilkinson rank sum test to just basically check if these uh, differences are consistent with respect to the expected biological behavior. So you've got sort of this um, identifying these different features among these classes and then performing pairwise tests among these subclasses to see whether these differences are consistent with respect to what you're expecting. And then you use um, LDA or linear discriminant analysis to estimate the effect size of each of these differently abundant features. And you could also do dimensionality reduction if desired. Uh, as a little aside, as we move forward in microbiome analysis in general, um, and I would say genomic analysis uh, in general, uh, we really have to watch out for this, that we've got this very biased uh, sampling of our microbial world, the very biased sequencing of our microbial world. 
And so, for example, we have tons and tons of E. coli genomes and not so many of certain environmental genomes. And so often uh, I find it's really helpful to do some dimensionality reduction of just the um, number of sequences I have so I don't have like tons and tons of E. coli. I take subsamples, some of those guys, and just take subsamples so I've got a more even spread of the organisms in whatever <coughs> database, say, I'm comparing the sequences to. I, I, can, I can talk about that more later. Uh, but uh, it, there's some really nice uh, description on uh, Huttenhauer's site uh, of, of Lefsey, and I, I, I won't go through this a lot, but just to say that um, They've got a really nice uh, set of features, a lot of nice um, uh, visuals, uh, basically being able to look at, uh, you know, plots of features with statistically different conditions and uh, looking at representation of these features on taxonomic or phylogenetic trees. And so looking at things by effect size. So in short, uh, allows you to... Um, uh, and this sort of walks you through that concept of how you're trying to sort of first have your biological hypothesis of your conditions, then you've got your estimates, then you're using LEFC, and then getting these uh, different kinds of results. Okay, but uh, but anyways, I, I, again, I, I want to sort of get back to sort of big picture. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it appears that LEFC is uh, just non-parametric based. So uh, can we add, for example, co-values? Uh, that's a good question. Do you know by any chance? I don't know. No, I don't think so. Yeah, you don't think so? Okay. Okay, yeah, no, great question. Um, but uh, anyways, um, so what I want to do though is, is step back a little bit about some things around um, uh, assumptions of data and understanding these methods. Uh, you have to understand your assumptions about your data, statistical methods assumptions about your data, your limitations, and how to interpret your results. And so in short, you must choose, but choose wisely, uh, and really it depends on what you're doing, and, and I will sort of go through a few of these basics that you need to consider. Uh, one of the biggest issues is are you looking at discrete or categorical uh, results or continuous variables by, by categorical, you mean like are we trying to predict uh, uh, classes that are like uh, disease, not diseased, or are you like trying to, or are you trying to do continuous variables like um, what level of, um, of I don't know, um, um, what do you call that stuff, uh, uh, LDL or HDL you have in your blood or, you know, what, um, what level of some sort of continuous measured variable you have and you want to sort of work out uh, correlations between levels uh, or, or um, yeah, sorry. Sorry, just, just need to step back a second and Yeah. So briefly, what, what did you describe about the data? Um, maybe I'll come, if that's okay, I'll come back to that at the end. And, uh, but uh, I just want to go through some basics first. Uh, but basically, um, uh, <coughs> do you, the concept of, uh, you know, discrete or ca continuous variables, and also do your samples involve known classes, or do you not know how many classes there are and you have to do what they call unsupervised learning. So generally, statistical techniques either try to predict um, uh, labels. Um, uh, for example, uh, you know, like classification of samples as diseased or not diseased. Um, it, you know, basically, you know your classes. It's pretty simple. You're just trying to predict those classes, OK? And uh, one of the issues, I have to say, with this kind of class prediction is you really have to often step back before you're going to do your bar biomarker analysis and say, are those really my classes? You know, is that really, are those really the patients I want to be classifying as diseased versus not diseased? What about those people that are in the in-between part? How am I going to handle those? So, um, and because, uh, you know, your biomarkers are only going to be as good as your actual data that you're feeding in. Uh, regression analysis is, um, is what you use whenever you're trying to look at some va uh, variable. Uh, so uh, when you have a continuous variable, you know, a classic example is predicting tomorrow's stock prices. You're trying to predict a level. Um, and uh, very often there's an interest in predicting um, more continuous uh, variables and doing analyses that where you want to get the level and you don't want to just say this is class A or class B. 
Uh, the other thing you have to think about is whether you're doing supervised or unsupervised uh, uh, learning. Um, it basically, uh, you know, supervised learning is where you basically have the samples come from these known classes. So you know, for example, that samples 1, 2, and 4 are not diseased or uh, samples 3 and 5 are uh, diseased. Uh, or there's unsupervised uh, where you don't know what the classes are and you want to have the data tell you. It's sort of letting the data drive and it's saying, okay, I don't know. These samples are all X and I just want to know what the groupings are. Is uh, You know, you could get the data to tell you that sample 3 and sample 5 are different from samples 1, 2, and 3. And, uh, and really um, identifying uh, usually by clustering. But of course, uh, they're really not two categories. There's also semi-supervised uh, methods where you give them give the data a bit of a sense of what your um, your classes are. So, yeah. I have a question on unsupervised clustering because it gives a large number of classes, and now it's up to the researcher to decide which number they want to pick. So, do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah, we were just talking about that actually coming in. Uh, uh, again, I'll, I'll um, uh, talk more at the end, but uh, uh, but in it, it short, it, it is a big challenge and it's always bugged me, these methods that say you have to specify how many clusters you have because you don't know how many clusters you have, right? Uh, and so that's why this sort of semi-supervised is, is very popular or attractive, being able to get a bit of a driving sense of, you know, what you're... Um, analyses, but I will I will come back to that at the end. But just um, but I do want to say that uh, uh, you really do have to watch that issue of how you cluster. And you know all you have to do is take a bunch of vegetables and put them out on a table. Or my one of my favorites is um, and my son was referring to this the other day. By the way, uh, this concept of uh, computers and machine learning is getting better and better, but they still have trouble with certain things like classifying. Have you guys ever seen classifying labradoodles from fried chicken? Have you guys seen that? It's hilarious. There's pictures of lab, you know, labradoodles that are the color of fried chicken, and they've got the same kind of poofiness. And then the fried chicken pictures and um, um, machine learning methods can have trouble with this. And so, uh, the other day, just yesterday, my son uh, was, uh, who's 14, was. Uh, I was bringing up this uh, classification issue, but but they can't even differentiate dogs from chicken, fried chicken, you know. So how can they do this, you know, kind of issue? So it really is a big challenge. But it, uh, let me come back to that. I'm digressing. Um, so for supervised methods, you know, I really want to emphasize. I mean, this is the sort of easy situation, simpler study design. Um, so the biomarkers could be more robust. So what it means is it's nice if you have that metadata, right? And, uh, and so I'd really like to emphasize the importance of getting that metadata and grabbing that metadata. And in your cases, if you're, if you're ever collecting some data and you don't really need maybe a certain type of metadata, you know, try to add it to your sequence data anyways when you submit it to um, a repository because uh, there, you don't know when somebody else is going to find that's really useful and having that metadata or uh, I'm, I'm not a big fan of metadata by the way because it implies somehow that the sequence data is the most important and metadata is just everything else. Uh, it's sort of like the other data but you want your sequence data with any other information associated with those sequences tagged onto that. But uh, <clears throat> the disadvantage though is uh, you know as I alluded to is, is, you know, you really might not have well-defined classes, so it's really difficult to find biomarkers, particularly when your classes aren't really clear um, and maybe sometimes, in some cases, are flat wrong. So the, the unsupervised can be really nice because it doesn't assume anything, and so you can really sort of see what those clusters are. And uh, But uh, really, um, how do you know that they're real? I really struggle with this issue, as was alluded to, of, you know, how do you know that you're really getting um, real classes? Because, you know, you can arbitrarily classify anything into, into any two classes, but, uh, but you know, really is, uh, um, you know, are they significant? And this is where a further statistical tests to show that those, those classes are different enough is, is really valuable and where validation becomes really important. Uh, you may require you testing very large sample sizes to get this properly, and 
does tend to be a little more computationally intensive, but that's not, uh, I don't find that's uh, too bad uh, these days. We've got, uh, now we've got two new um, really big supercomputer clusters um, in Canada, one at SFU, and where's the other one? I think it's Montreal. What's that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so at Waterloo and, and SFU, we've got two really big computer clusters. And as an aside, oh, uh, I wanted to see how many people are not from Canada. There's not that many, right? Uh, there are a few of you. Okay, welcome. <laughs> yeah, uh, welcome. And uh, But uh, for for those of you in Canada or any, anyone collaborating with anybody in Canada, I mean, just a reminder, you can get a free Compute Canada account and lots and lots of store, disk storage and CPU access, just base, base allocation that's actually pretty decent. And everybody who's got any kind of academic appointment, student appointment, or is collaborating with an academic can get one of these accounts. And uh, it can be very useful for doing uh, certain analyses that are computationally intensive. And so, and one concern they have is, in Compute Canada is not enough biologists are using it. Uh, so they are really keen to sort of um, uh, try to encourage that. Okay, so anyways, uh, so say um, UID, and, I, and I'm, I'm going through this, uh, as you can see, sort of very generally, because I do want to get to the point of, um, I'm just trying to see what time's like. Uh, I do want to get to the point of going through an example uh, as a sort of better way to sort of show this. Uh, so once you ID your groups and you want to choose a biomarker, you need to test it. So PCR is obviously a uh, a really good uh, example. So, for example, you could identify something uh, using something like Metaflan, a marker-based tool, cluster the reads, find conserved sequences, verify that these sequences are selective. And again, I'll talk about that more later. Uh, design some primers, uh, like using primer prospector uh, from a sequence alignment or primer blast, which designs primers specific to a clade. And, um, and basically, from there, you're sort of validating what you're getting. But uh, I would like to go through a case study uh, just to give you a sense of, you know, an example of doing some biomarkers and some of the challenges that uh, um, that exist. Uh, though again, I'm not super great detail, but I just want to acknowledge this great um, uh, group of researchers we're collaborating with for a Genome Canada study <clears throat> that basically was looking at um, using metagenomics to identify markers of water quality. And uh, there's some more information on watershedDiscovery.ca, but hasn't been updated in a while. <clears throat> but I'd like to particularly acknowledge uh, Will Sow's, uh, the BC Center for Disease Control, and um, uh, oh, Natalie should be acknowledged here too, and Patrick Tang, who used to be at the BC Center for Disease Control, and uh, they uh, and Matthew Croxon. Uh, that basically played a key role in getting um, some samples. And Thea Van Rossum and Mike Piabati are graduate students in my group who were uh, really leading the bioinformatics analysis for this uh, uh, project. And uh, so why do we care about this? We, we really wanted to move towards an ecosystem approach to water quality monitoring. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, people tend to feel pretty relaxed about their water. They feel confident. You know, many people feel confident about water quality, but water quality is a big issue. Uh, water is becoming a big issue. There's, it's a valuable resource. The climate models are not good for how much um, California is going to be needing water, and they're looking towards Canada as a source. And we don't, we do have some. We do have lots, but we don't have an unlimited supply. And so. Uh, uh, there's a lot of interest in improving water quality monitoring, identifying um, issues more at the source rather than this testing we do. Even the BC <laughs> Center for Disease Control, um, which is required for all the, which is the center for doing water quality testing in BC, which is a bit unusual. It's uh, in, um, for environmental testing. It's actually at a disease center, uh, but. Uh, but basically, a lot of testing is done at the tap, and what we want to do is look more at the source and nip these sources of contamination so we can avoid these uh, regions of Canada where they have 365 days of the year boil water advisories. Uh, so the um, uh, big concern is um, fecal coliforms is, is one that is really um, ID'd very inaccurately. Uh, coliforms or the coliform test is, is woefully inadequate because, of course, there's a lot of problems with false negatives. Not all pathogens are coliforms. 
<clears throat> and also false positives because not all coliforms are pathogens, right? Just because you get a high coliform count doesn't actually mean that water is bad. So a lot of beaches get closed unnecessarily or um, you end up with something showing up like a protozoan pathogen or something that isn't detected and you end up with people getting sick when they're you have perfectly low uh, cal coliform count. So, so really there's an interest in developing a panel of qPCR based assays based on metagenomic sur surveys to basically identify these pathogens and measures of water quality uh, more accurately using a greater number of um, sort of markers. So what we wanted to do uh, was we looked at a control watershed <clears throat> where it's actually completely protected. Uh, in BC, we have really fantastic water uh, because the water just basically is distilled uh, from the ocean, comes over, falls as rain, and then is in these protected watersheds where there's not even boating allowed or anything. Uh, but, uh, but basically, you have this control watershed, uh, human impacted watershed where there's um, concern about septic tank leakage, and agricultural impacted watershed where there's um, feces uh, leaking um, occurring uh, from um, agricultural use and these different land uses. We wanted to look at uh, these samples. We looked at uh, 96 samples collected over one year plus additional one year or hourly time courses. And in short, we just showed that in hourly, um, water was not changing that much. But uh, so these sort of monthly samples turned out to be actually very useful. Um, we filtered the water actually um, at different levels, uh, looking at uh, viral uh, viral particles, uh, bacteria, and uh, protists, or other micro or what we call micro eukaryotes. And then we did luminous sequencing of the DNA um, and viral RNA, looking at 16s, 18s for eukaryotes, CPN60, shotgun metagenomic sequence, and basically did this bioinformatics analysis of this data. This was actually just the first survey of water um, in uh, rivers uh, as a time course at all uh, that is at this level. And then, of course, we're interested in biomarker identification. So um, so we had, um, I'll focus on one site that was particularly useful because we had sampling site upstream of contamination and then a site sort of at the site of, a site of contamination and a bit downstream. And again, we had monthly water samples. And again, I really want to encourage you know positive and negative controls. Just remember that uh, you uh, uh, too many microbiome analyses early on were done without positive and negative controls. You should always have some sort of bacteria spiked in water. You can buy uh, pre-prepared positive controls, and you should run that with every sequencing run, and do negative controls where you just put the you know. Um, sterile distilled water in, in your, and run it as a sample. Uh, these are really, we found those very useful. We were able to detect some contamination at one point and also uh, we're able to use those positive controls to assess our methods better and make sure everything was running okay. But, uh, but basically we looked at this microbiome survey looking at both taxa and G profiles, looked at differential features and then developing uh, qPCR tests. Uh, but again, uh, the first thing you always want to do before you start is really evaluate your methods. So we actually uh, developed some positive controls that were water-like, um, uh, you know, reflecting uh, types of conditions um, or types of taxa that are commonly found in water. Um, and we evaluated the methods. We decided to publish a paper on the evaluation because there had been such a lack of evaluations that were independent at the time. Uh, most evaluations of accuracy of methods were, you know, uh, there's all these methods out here and, hey, we've developed our method and, hey, our method is best, you know, because, of course, the way they evaluate it, right, is, is optimized to theirs. So we wanted to do something more independent. And so we evaluated the methods and, um, in short, uh, I would say I, I often get asked, there's no easy answer, but the methods are all over the map in terms of their precision, uh, their specificity versus sensitivity, um, how much they uh, predict at sort of high taxonomic levels and versus sort of more at the species level. And, uh, it, you know, in short, there's no one method that's great uh, versus others. But I would say if you're ever starting out with metagenomics analysis, certainly uh, Metaflan, as you've learned about, is sort of a good fast marker-based method just to get a feel for what your data is. It has very high precision. Um, 
but low sensitivity. And when I say Metaflan, I mean Metaflan 2 or whatever. Like, for example, Megan is another method that's uh, uh, good. But, you know, when I say Megan, I mean I can mean Megan 4. Megan 5 is, you know, better. Megan 6. But uh, uh, essentially, um, uh, you know, you're, you're basically this concept of... <clears throat> of uh, developing biomarkers, what we did is we did sort of fast track kind of approaches and then more in-depth approaches. And the fast track approach allowed us to sort of very quickly in the project get some markers that we could start testing just to sort of see, you know, in other watersheds, for example, are we getting the same thing or not? Um, and uh, so here's an example, just a really fast one, uh, where we took the bacterial shotgun data using the Illumina high seek data, um, using Metaflan, uh, we basically, um, and which had sort of 3,000 uh, reference genomes and can run, you know, 3 million reads in 10 minutes, so it's super fast. Um, basically, what we did is uh, first we <coughs> processed and validated the data, doing the sort of positive control validation, confirming that DNA-free uh, water spiked with DNA from multiple taxa of lab-cultured bacteria. We did, in fact, get those bacteria back. And uh, only 7% of reads were assigned by Metaflan to a species. Um, I mean, this is very expected for this method. This is not a, um, uh, this is a method that does well if you have um, a lot of sort of known species in your data set. Like, for example, if you're doing a gut microbiome where there's more of the species of the gut microbiome, a lot more of those species are in these um, reference databases. <clears throat> and the um, and so this was not surprising. Of of those, eighty four percent were co correctly assigned. So it's not predicting a lot, but it is when it does make predictions, it's being um, pr uh, pretty accurate. And uh, but then you want to sort of different identify the taxa. Now it was really frustrating for me that for this particular marker, um, they weren't keen on us revealing the data, the universities, it's frustrating, but uh, so we call them taxon one and, ta and taxon two, but uh, but the idea is um, we just prioritized high abundance taxa with the idea that if you're going to do a sort of dipstick test in water, you'd rather look at the more high abundance ones. And so use a white um, non-parametric t-test with false discovery rate, uh, very important multiple test correction. Uh, to find differentially abundant taxa, and uh, basically we were able to find uh, some obvious taxa that were different for upstream of your sample or versus at the site and downstream, um, where these are sort of the generally the sort of impacted uh, water versus upstream is the clean water. Um, as a little aside, I'll just mention, I don't have really time to talk about it, but I've really become more interested in using random forests for some analyses and uh, encourage that as another sort of um, machine learning kind of method for identifying uh, differential uh, taxa. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, anyways, uh, so we um, identified uh, 57,000 uh, reads were assigned to this taxon 1, 2,000 reads assigned to taxon 2, and we prioritized this one just because we thought more uh, high abundance taxa um, would be better, and there was evidence that they do tend to get more accurately predicted. And we extracted these sequences from the Metaflan database, literally, you know, took the 607 taxa uh, sequences that are associated with taxon 1 from Metaflan, aligned these reads, the sequence reads against these sequences, and then chose regions of Metaflan sequences with the most hits. So, for example, you might have your Metaflan marker sequence that's in their database. You have... Um, <clears throat> you, you identify reads that are characteristic of that, and maybe you find one area where you have a sort of candidate marker sequence because you've got a lot of reads in that one area. And, uh, and then we just use primer 3 for primer and probe design, uh, looking basically at uh, first in silico, um, taking those sequences and just saying in, in a computer whether you get... Um, uh, you know, uh, what rates you get of these candidate sort of primer amplicons and probes, resulting probes. And basically we, uh, you can see sort of here, uh, if you look at these, um, uh, that uh, this is uh, high-seq reads that, uh, or these sort of um, 
right one or the sort of right one um, primer um, reads that contain the sequence, you can sort of see that upstream you get um, uh, not much, and at, at the site or downstream you've got the sort of former pro forward primer or the probe or the reverse primer. You're all getting some sort of uh, uh, reads that contain this uh, forward primer, sequence, reverse primer, or probe. Just, uh, and uh, as a little aside, just note that we did consider matches that are um, exact or have one to two mismatches to reflect the fact that with PCR you can't have allowance of matches. Uh, uh, for those of you familiar with PCR, you'll appreciate that it depends where you're looking at three prime or five prime end of the, the primer, but uh, um, thankfully there are some nice methods that can do that quite easily. But it, basically you're choosing sequences that minimize these non-specific matches and what's nice is we were able to confirm we could amplify this product. We actually didn't take this too far because we got interested in some other markers instead. But, uh, but basically we could amplify, you know, the product of the right size through this. Um, but, uh, you know, this is identifying a marker based on differential abundance of a bacterial species. And, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, was used sort of as a pilot, which was great because it was fast, you know, sequence data to primers in a couple of days. It allowed us to very quickly, because inevitably with any kind of microbiome research, it takes a while till you get the samples done and sequence and you start and you do your QC and you finally get your data that's good. And meanwhile, the people who are in the lab ready to validate are like, come on, give me something. So uh, it does allow you to get to that uh, quickly. Um, but I, I really want to emphasize the limitations here. It really does depend on the differential abundance of these known bacteria. So bacteria are highly similar to those in the Metaflan database, then um, this approach won't work. Uh, you know, so you might have some really interesting markers, but they're just not in Metaflan, particularly if you're dealing with samples that are out of the sort of gut microbial realm. Uh, if you're looking at different conditions or different sites where um, there's a lot more uh, tax out there that we have not identified or have not uh, characterized yet. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, it is based on taxa, which have been shown to be more variable across environments and gene functions. So, uh, you know, this is a low-hanging fruit kind of approach to sort of find something. <clears throat> the, uh, the alternative approach is sort of more complete analysis of sort of shotgun data. It can either be bacterial or viral or whatever. But uh, the idea is to use something like Kraken or Discriminate um, is a method I just wanted to highlight. There's, the, again, there's that review of accuracy of methods, which that review, we had so many comments of people just wanting more information because we'd, we'd sort of laid it out as, you know, you have to consider this, consider this, but a lot of people were looking for, just tell me what methods I should be using. Uh, so we actually did do a little frequently asked questions response in the paper, and then the journal decided to change the um, display of all papers in, is it uh, BMC? I can't remember what, where this was published, but I think it was BMC. And all those comments for every single paper got lost, like they're just gone. So just so you know, there's all this commentary associated with papers and it was just gone. And uh, they were working, um, last I heard, to try to get those back. Uh, but uh, we ended up ad adding our comments to the bottom of the um, PubMed. Um, citations. So if you go to the abstract of this paper at the bottom, there's uh, our attempt to add some frequently asked questions and respond to some comments um, made there. Uh, anyway, so um, uh, we did gene function analysis at the time. It was sort of Megan 4, Megan 5. You know, things have changed in terms of new methods coming out and methods as being described in this, uh, in this workshop uh, or summer school, I guess I should call it, um, using seed and keg databases. Uh, basically, we were getting the seek, uh, getting these predicted proteins, clustering, find differential fe features, then designing PCR. And so, um, again, uh, looking at taxa or functions, um, we identified uh, informative regions for primer design using uh, CD hit to cluster reads by identity. And uh, we designed primers using Primer Blast or the IDT real time PCR tool and validated those primers using Primer Prospector or Primer Blast, and then validated uh, using just in vitro Q Q QPCR. And to get to a nutshell, because I'm realizing I'm running out of time, uh, is uh, the QPCR uh, worked quite nicely with certain uh, markers. We were able to find, um, if this is just looking at Comona 
Dacia. I always have trouble uh, saying it. And this is showing your percentage of sequences over samples for the uh, you know upstream clean uh, water at the source of pollution and downstream and uh, is an example of where of a particular tax at least where um, very consistently we were able to find um, uh, those sequences uh, you know pred more predominant in the polluted and um, <clears throat> Uh, and then this just shows you the number of reads in your cluster versus num and number of amplicons generated in silico. Uh, but most notably, when we did the qPCR for this marker gene, asper aspartate carbamyl transferase um, from limnohabitans, um, <clears throat> we found uh, we got some good data, and also um, we've seen this in other samples as well uh, that we were able to get. Um, uh, you know, no detectable uh, results of, uh, you know, for qPCR, uh, you sort of have a CT value. And uh, we were above, uh, over that line of the uh, undetectable signal, basically, this is sort of undetectable uh, levels. And we were able to get that uh, for the upstream clean water, then the, cl uh, the dirty water. We did have some technical errors where we got no signal for the positive control, too. So, Again, an example of use of positive controls being useful. But uh, I think in a nutshell, the point is that we were able to get from, just through that very simple approach, get to an actual qPCR validation of some primers that are now being investigated for improving uh, testing water quality. And um, a, another comment I want to make, um, because I'm going to talk about some general considerations here now at the end, is... I, uh, it's, it's really um, helpful whenever you go to do biomarker analysis that you also include some sort of ethical, legal, social issues. In Genome, in genome Canada, we have this gel thing. I'm a member of the board for Genome Canada, so I'm sort of a, familiar with this. And we found it really useful that when in parallel, while we were doing this microbiome analysis and the biomarker analysis, we were also asking the end users, the people doing water quality testing, what kind of things do they want to see in their biomarkers? What kind of things do they care about? What what issues do they have? And sort of lots of great points came up, like they didn't want to have to lug 50 liters of water from a remote site. Uh, so they really wanted to tests that would work with small volumes. Um, obviously, in some uh, hospital environments, that issue of transporting samples isn't a, as big a deal. Uh, it, or, you know, you don't have to necessarily deal with large sample volumes. Uh, they also, uh, it was interesting how much there was um, an interest in getting biomarkers that had some known um, association with disease. So they didn't want to just, it, it's, this is spartate um, carbamyl <coughs> transferase. Um, you know, they weren't so interested in that because it, this was an example of something where there was no association with disease with this marker. It was definitely associated with the dirty water versus clean water, but there was no sort of known biological information that implied that this one reason why that would be. And so uh, they really did prefer to have some markers, at least some markers in a panel of markers that were, you know, towards certain pathogens or towards certain kind of disease-causing genes, virulence factors. And so uh, it's something I just really want to encourage you guys, if you're ever developing any kind of biomarkers, you know, ask those end users what kinds of things they're looking for, because sometimes that can really help in the end with um, also getting use of the biomarkers, but also um, getting approval. Uh, in our case, we have to get sort of EPA approval um, and I say envir U.S. Environmental Protection Agency approval because the Canada is funny that if to get things to be approved environmentally in Canada, you have to get it approved in the U.S. first, and then Canada looks towards the U.S. for approval. So I hate to say it, but this uh, the issues happening south of the border impact us uh, indirectly too that way, but uh, uh, with cuts to environmental protection, but. Uh, but in short, so we may have to step up our game in, in Canada, but it's interesting how much we do do that. And being aware of that process, it actually guided us back at the very beginning of thinking about what markers we wanted to prioritize. Uh, so uh, do look into that. Okay, anyways, uh, but just to remember other markers, community diversity. I'm not a big fan of community diversity as an indicator, uh, as a marker. But I think uh, certainly um, I'm a big believer of not looking at limiting taxa to just bacteria. 
and uh, looking at other things like metabolites and, um, and gene-based analyses. And so I'm just going to show you some examples of data just to help illustrate that uh, need to look at other taxa. So here's that same watershed study looking at bacteria, 16S data, and bacteriophage data. And these are the you know, sites, and this is like how many kilometers apart they are. And um, it's, it was really striking how much the bacteria um, were not uh, sort of location um, specific. And this is well known. Uh, it's well known that there's this sort of, um, you know, water in far parts of Canada, for example, will have the same taxa in these different, um, you know, uh, uh, locations. But yet the bacteriophage are really quite distinct. You really see the... Um, uh, the geographical um, uh, uh, differences between the virus and, and it's not just bacteriophage, other viruses show real spatial patterns in these different watersheds we were looking at. And one of the reasons, uh, I don't have time to get into it, is that we think the 16S metagenomics data do not differentiate active versus dormant cells. So I want to remind you when you're doing metagenomics, you're doing a mixture of both the live stuff, the dead stuff, the dormant stuff. Um, whereas the viruses do tend to reflect more sort of activity, um, they will tend to bloom in response to, you know, an active um, bacterial, uh, uh, you know, um, population uh, dividing. And so, uh, you know, I guess uh, the, one of the theories is this is, this is a bit of a reflection of the sort of, um, uh, that this is showing sort of, um, in some cases, what's active, uh, and we're investigating this further. And I want to note that we, we see this trend if we look at lower taxonomic resolutions, if we look at genes, if we look at overall metagenome ca content, look at subset of phage, there really is a difference between how viruses are more distinct in different sites versus bacteria. Um, this is just uh, another bit of data just to show that there's other differences. Um, I don't, again, don't have time to go through this, but here's like a mantel our statistic of looking at um, <clears throat> the bacteria versus DNA viruses, bacteria taxa versus bacteria metagenomics, and bacteria taxa versus RNA virome, etc. And um, and basically the uh, you know how much their synchrony uh, is is showing here by this uh, this value, and then there's sort of like the um, uh, oh darn I really uh, uh, there's the uh, so you can see that um, the uh, just overall synchrony here, and uh, I don't remember what the green dots are, so I can get back to you about that. But uh, but basically the NDMS plot here of just, um, for example, some um, uh, DNA viruses and RNA viruses revealed really surprising synchrony um, over time. Uh, and, uh, you know, we basically have a sort of in Vancouver area where the samples were taken. We basically have a dry season and a wet season. And uh, you can really see that here. This is sort of the dry season, then the things shift over to the wet season. And this is sort of looking over time. And uh, in short, uh, you know, we would not have seen all of this if we'd just been looking at bacterial data. Uh, and seeing this, we were very surprised at the degree of synchrony of the DNA viruses and RNA viruses, and we're not actually sure what's going on there. Um, and then uh, I'll just mention that we also have differences. Last thing is in the bacteria metagenome uh, versus the DNA virome in terms of response uh, to certain environmental um, uh, sort of other data. So, for example, uh, whether it's sort of... Um, the rainy season versus dry season, or uh, shifts for uh, from drain, rainy season for dry season, you have big shifts in the bacterial data, but not in the viral data. The viral data is not changing in response to sudden rainfall, uh, whereas the bacterial data is. Presumably, it's sort of all this material coming in, um, being washed into the river. So, uh, one thing I, I want you to appreciate is the idea of looking at different kinds of taxa. Another thing, I just had to put in a little pug for, for something led by actually Rob Biko, um, just this concept of um, diversity and that we should be really supporting diversity. There's a lot of conservation biology and theories developed for how to support diversity on this planet, but it's all mac macroscopic organisms, back to that little cartoon I had at the beginning. 
And we really need to draw upon conservation biology and think about microbiomes and how we want to protect microbiomes and look at the diversity of these microbiomes and have some sort of stewardship of these microbiome mm -hmm. diversities, not just for human, but for other microbiomes um, on Earth as well. And again, remember other um, uh, markers and uh, uh, the markers are only as good as the data they're based on. So you really have to design these experiments carefully, including positive and negative controls. And uh, I, I don't have time to get into it. I keep saying that, but it's true. Um, but there's some low abundance microbes are, um, are suspect. Uh, and uh, I really want to encourage you to sort of uh, get rid of those uh, sort of really low abundance predictions, uh, sort of things that are like less than 0.1% uh, of the data. A lot of those you should probably throw out because some of them are just random sequence errors that can just result in things being falsely predicted as one thing versus another. So uh, just uh, there's some information in that paper about this. Another paper I'll point you to is um, uh, just t talks about how microbiome average genome size can impact results. So if you have a average genome size in one condition versus another condition, that can impact um, your normal and, and normalization and results you get for predicting taxa. And uh, because you're uh, literally, uh, you've got so much DNA, but you've got a larger genome with, you know, uh, the, the, the number of copies of that one gene versus all the DNA is different in one condition with a large average genome size versus a small average genome size. So appreciate these biases and limitations in what's in sequence databases. We really are uh, touching on the uh, surface. Oh, dear. And consider microbial level, this idea about dormant. Remember, there's live dead stuff that you're dealing with in any g given situation and consider looking at other uh, bacteria. And here's a, just another, or an article that just sort of emphasizes this fact of having uh, controls. Okay, um, uh, I just want to uh, also emphasize that bi biomarker discovery is really just the start. Uh, that, you know, validation is key. And I want to encourage you guys to avoid the overselling the microbiome award, if you've heard of that from uh, Jonathan Eisen. Uh, there's a lot out there right now. There's a lot of... Um, uh, what do you call it? Snake oil is what they use in in English. Uh, so uh, you know we really need to um, watch out for that and make sure that what the the predictions we're making are robust as possible. However, there is a lot of promise in the future, and I think we're going to see this um, this idea of the microbiome and appreciating the important role of it is literally like in at least in our bodies. You know, our gut microbiome is like another organ. You know, it's a tissue that is functioning and producing things like uh, our, these metabolites that are used for our circadian rhythms, etc. So, uh, I, of course, this work was done uh, with a large team of people, and I really want to acknowledge um, researchers from the BC Center for Disease Control, and SFU in particular, uh, my students, uh, Thea and Mike, uh, for playing a, a great role in, in moving this work forward. And we're just submitting a paper and now uh, that's sort of a culmination of um, a lot of these uh, efforts shortly. And if anybody's interested in this stuff, we can certainly disseminate.